Cheryl Alexander needs to be shot. <laughs> she sent me a picture. She sent me, <laughs> she sent me a picture this afternoon of a plate of Ugandan food. I said, that is not fair. Oh, man, I love that stuff. But they're getting a good dose of it. It's going to be an exciting, exciting time for them. And, and just, I, I really pray that God will use this time to really speak to their hearts and that we'll see some young missionaries come out of this. And uh, so just be, be in prayer for them. Pray for their safety. The roads over there are not fun. But, uh, uh, you know, that's just, that's Africa. And uh, I'm going to, I was talking to Pastor before, before he left, and, and we were talking about, you know, he wanted me to preach and what kind of what direction he'd have me to go and everything. And, and we got talking, he said, you know, just kind of some mission messages really to kind of give us uh, this in between the mission conference and, and everything, give us a shot in the arm. And... Uh, I, I've preached this here before. I think it was about 10 years ago. How many of you have been here 10 years? Okay, if you heard it, tough. You're going to hear it again. <laughs> but if, if it's 10 years ago, if you're like me, if it's 15 minutes past, I'm not responsible anymore. I don't remember nothing. But I want to have you turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 14. Uh, if you've heard this before, it's, uh, the repetition will be good for you. But we thought that m most of the folks would not uh, have heard it. And so I think it'll be an exciting uh, passage for you. It's called The Feeding of the 1500. Uh, you got that in your Bible? The Feeding of the 1500. Now, if you'll begin with me in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. It says, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening... His disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said to them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up into heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they, all, they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. You say 5,000, I thought you said 1,500. Hold on, we'll get there. Are these just stories out of a book? Are they just stories of a God in what we call the Bible? Does God really do these things today, now? God can, and I'm here to tell you God does. Do you ever wonder what keeps missionaries going? They go through some really some pretty rough times. And the difficulties, they just keep on going. 
Have you ever seen missionaries come back to the state and they're just down in the mouth and they're crying the blues and they don't want to go back and everything? Already our, our grandkids are, are wanting to go back. And if the truth was known, uh, many of them wouldn't even want to come back. What makes them keep going? Driving on. Missing their families. They don't see their families a lot of times for four, four years, five years, some of them even ten. And yet they stay on the mission field and they, they keep going and, and all the different hardships and things. It's because they see the undeniable hand of God working right there amongst them. You can, you, you can see it. You can feel it. You can watch God work. We're so busy here in America that we don't take time to even try to look. But God is working. Back in, in 2000, when Sherry and I was missionaries over in Uganda, we were working in Soroti. It's up in the northeastern part of the country. And we had a good church there, a Bible college. I mean, everything. We were drilling wells. We, you name it, we was involved in it. And there was a famine going on. And so, and famines are real. And they happen over there. Back here, not so much, but uh, we don't notice it. But over there, they really do. And so you have people in villages starving and Richard was one of the guys he translated for me. He, we worked in the radio station that we started together. We, he, he, he'd go to the villages with me. He works in our compound and everything. And his folks was really going through some hard times. So we said, okay, let's, let's go ahead and get some things together. Cher and I put, you know, we got some bread and we got some pocho flour and we got some uh, some bananas and we got some different things and we got together a bunch of food and told Richard let's go ahead and get in the car and we'll go on out to the village and we'll give this to your folks because I know they're, they're really hurting these family so we did we got in a vehicle we went on out there and the family greeted us they was very happy to see us uh, especially the food <laughs> And, and they took that and they went into the house and disappeared. Now, you might think that's being rude. Over there, it's not rude. They will leave you standing there or sitting there or whatever. And you go out or they go out and they start rounding up the people in the village. And as they were rounding them all up and bringing them back uh, and, and some of them, they come in and start standing under the mango tree and, and we just kind of wait there and look at each other for a while until, until they get back and they'll change their clothes and get all ready and then they'll come out and they'll say, okay, preacher, give us the word of God. I want to pray, I want to ask God to show you something tonight. We act as if God is dead. That God really, I know he says he can, but God really can't. And I want to pray that God really opens your heart and speaks to your heart tonight. There's some of you that could go as missionaries. But there's that fear. There's that wonder. What's going to happen to me? What, how, how's he going to take care of me? What's going to go on and everything? And I really want you to get a hold of, of what I'm, I'm telling you. And I've got witnesses here that can, can vouch for this. My son can vouch for it, all these different things. But I, I, I really want you to get a hold of this tonight. Father, Lord, you're in control. And Lord, these people have come back tonight asking you to bless them. They come here to worship you. And honor you and lift up your name and song and all these different things. Lord, we ask God tonight that you'd open our hearts, that you'd help us to be responsive, that we might understand 
that you're not just a God in a book, but you're our God and you can and you do magnificent things, miraculous things right in front of us and many times we miss what you're doing. I pray God that you would speak to hearts tonight, speak to the people over there in, in Africa from our church that Lord, they're experiencing some of these things and they'll be able to see hopefully some of these wonderful things that you're doing in that country. God bless us as we study in Jesus name. Amen. After we took the food to them and they were grateful for that and thanked us and everything and he come, got the village together and then said, okay, give us the word of God, preacher. Well, you don't have any pulpits or nothing. You just grab your book and you just start walking around under the mango trees and around through the people and wherever they're sitting and you just kind of meander around and you preach the word of God. You preach the gospel to them. But just like in, in this pulpit, I can see all of you. And when I do, I can tell many times if I'm getting across. You, you can tell by people's face, you know, lights on, nobody's home. You know, so, so you, you ask the Lord as a pastor, I'm just being honest with you. As a pastor, you say, Lord, help me. Give me an illustration that I can get my point across to them and that they'll really grasp a hold of what, uh, of what we're trying to preach here. And I was preaching salvation. I'd never been in that village before. And normally we have people get saved pretty much all the time. When we go out to a village, somebody gets saved. But I'm preaching and it's just like you can see, they're not getting it. You can tell it on their face, their response. And I said, Lord, give me, give me an illustration that I can use that they will understand. And he did. And they understood. I said, if somebody comes running in the village in this direction and they start hollering, Coney's here, Coney's here. I said, what would you do? Their eyes got as big as saucers. Now to you, that didn't mean anything. Anybody ever heard of Coney? A couple of you. Coney was a rebel. I still don't know if he's alive or dead. He, he's always eluded the people. Nobody's got his body yet. But uh, he'd come in. He was one of these guys that would come in and they would, they would go to a school like they'd go to your high school out here and they would surround the school and they would basically capture the school and they'd blow away the teachers because the teachers weren't any good. They're adults and they, you know, they, you can't hardly brainwash some of these adults. But then they'd take the, the high schoolers and they'd take the, the boys and say, okay, you gonna fight for me? And if they said no, boom. Now, you gonna fight for me? Well, you better say yes. We don't, we're not even getting in to the girls part of it. It is a hundred times worse than you could ever imagine. But they take these kids, the boys and the girls, take them back to their village and they get them out there and they, they start brainwashing them. They get them in drugs. They, 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 all of these different things. And then they line them up and they say, okay, are you going to fight for me? Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm in a bad situation, I like to get as close as I can to somebody I know or somebody that I may some, have some, something in, in common with or that they may be able to help me or something. And it's the same way over there. They have friends and, I mean, schoolmates and maybe a brother, sister, maybe a cousin, brother or something. And when they look at you and say, okay, are you going to fight for me? You say, yes. Then they hand you a machete and say, kill him. If he doesn't, they put a bullet in his brain. He has to or he dies. And they're not fooling around. And he takes that machete and it may be his brother, it may be his cousin, it may be a schoolmate, a good friend, and they hack him to death. 
What are they doing? They're cutting all ties to the village, to the family, to anything. How are you going to go back to your village and they say, where's John? I killed him. And then that evening after you've killed him and after they've got you all on dope and drugs and, and booze and everything else, then they have you eat him. So now you go back to your village, where's John? How are you going to tell them that you killed their boy? How are you going to tell them that you ate him? You have no idea what goes on in these countries. I mean, I've got the attention of the Ugandans. Kony is ruthless. They go into villages and to get people to, to not let, them, let the officials know that they're there. They'll take one, a couple of the women and they'll drill holes through their lips and put a padlock on them. To let everybody know, don't you say a word or we'll come get you. And I'm just giving you the, the stuff I can say. Now, these people are, are scared to death. I'm saying, what would happen if somebody come running in to your village and said, Coney is coming? They knew exactly what I was talking about. And as I pleaded with them, I was trying to get them to see the difference between a head belief, knowing about God, and a heart belief, putting your faith and trust in God. And as I'm going through this, and, and they were understanding now, not one person in that village would put their faith and trust in Christ. It broke our hearts. Not even Richard's family. And he'd been saved and working with us, and, but they still, none of them would get saved. We finished up what we were doing, the message, and talking with people as best we could and, and, and greeting the family again, and, and we left, and we went back, to, back home, back to town where, we, uh, where our home was. We thought that, that was just a normal day for us. About 2 o'clock in the morning, the shooting starts. A tank round went off behind our house. I mean, automatic gunfire, AK-47s and submachine guns and everything else are going off. The whole town, I mean, we were, it was crazy. Bullets flying through the yard and, and we all hunkered down. We got I got Sherry, we got out there in, the, in, the, in the, our sitting room, in our living room, and we just sat there looking at each other. I told her, I said, you put every stitch of clothes you can get on. I don't want to make it any easier for these creeps if they get across that wall. And we sat there for hours. You can't say nothing. Just idle words, just, and you're listening to all this going on. You can't get in the car and take off. They'll think you're the enemy. Either the military will shoot you or the rebels will think you're military and they'll shoot you. And you're sitting there and saying, I'm supposed to be the man of the house. And if these guys come over this wall, what am I going to do? And the shooting goes on and on and on. We finally said, well, let's just go lay down on the bed. We were just emotionally exhausted. And we laid down on the bed and I just staring at the ceiling and there's nothing really you can say. And we, we laid down there and I, I guess we must have went to sleep. Now I forgot you know how in our mission conferences sometimes we will call a missionary on that field and we'll talk to the missionary and, you know, how's it going, how's the work going and all that. And the whole congregation can hear the phone call. You know, how, you ever been seen that? We, we do it every once in a while. Well, that, I forgot all about that. 
uh, Dr. Chapel out in Lancaster was going to call us and interview us. They were having their mission conference. And we had evidently fallen asleep, and that phone rang. It scared the life out of me. And I jumped up, and I grabbed the phone and everything. He said, hey, Brother Brian, how's it going? <laughs> and I began to relate to him what was going on. They say, even several of them out there said, we, we could hear the bullet. We could hear the, the, the shooting and everything going on behind. Dr. Sisk was the head of our mission, and he was in that conference sitting out in here. He got out of his seat, run up to the platform, and they just began <laughs> to deal with me. and pray. It changed their mission conference. And we finally hung up and we dozed back off to sleep and in the morning we, the shooting had subsided. And I got Richard and we got in the vehicle and we, we drove out. There's a couple roads coming into town we started driving out one and just thousands of people coming in from the villages on both sides of the road. It, it's difficult to even drive down there. And, and all they had is what they had on their back. That's all the clothes. Some of them may have picked up a few pans or something on the way. Many of them, they just left their dead laying there. They couldn't bury them. They couldn't put grass on them. They couldn't do anything. They're just laying there. They run for their life. And thousands of these people are coming into the village. And I said, Richard, I wonder what's, what's going on out there by our church. So we turned around and we got through town and town was just filling up with people, thousands of them. And we got out there by our church. It's been 24 years and it's still fresh. Hundreds of people are sitting here in the front door of our church just with a dead look on their face. Can you help us? Can you help us? Now what in the world am I going to do? We'd already taken the money that we had at the end of the month and, and got the food and everything to take out to, to Richard's village. We had a little money for electric. We had a little money for a few things, but that was to pay bills. And I, They don't cover this in Bible college. And then, Lord, what in the world can we do? They'd hit Richard's village, the one that we were just at that day before. Many of the people were killed. Richard's family, his sister... The brother, or excuse me, her husband rather, and 12-year-old boy and their baby fled and made it into the church. And within about two days, there was nothing really that we thought we could do. And they tried to go back out to get some food because there, there's no food. And they went out there and they got caught by the rebels. And they shot her husband, killed him, killed the 12-year-old boy, beat her within an inch of her life, and then they proceeded to beat that three-month-old baby. Just, just She come to in the middle of the night and started crawling around, found her, her baby. She was still alive. And she dragged that baby and herself back through the the bush and until she found a military person and they brought her back to the church we put the baby in the hospital and started taking care of her the baby died that week we said we've got to do something the bible says we saw a great multitude there was thousands of them Ended up around 1,500 people at our church. 
How are you going to feed 1,500 people that come over for supper? Just all of a sudden, they didn't tell you this coming. We saw a great multitude. Other missionaries said, send them away. Let the UN and some of these people, other people, feed them. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I said, we don't have nothing, but we'll go find out. And we took, we had an envelope system that you put the money in the envelope so you have that money for bills and stuff. And we went in there and we cleaned out everything that we had in there and went down. And I was able to buy a half a sack of posho. A sack of posho is about 200 pounds of corn flour is what it is. And I had enough to buy 100 pounds, a half a sack. Now, how are you going to feed 1,500 people with 100 pounds of posho? I, I cowered it out. I really did. I could not give it out to some and then know that I'm going to have to tell the rest of them. There ain't no more. I had my men start distributing, and I, started, I went to the house. I just couldn't handle it. On the way, I get a phone call from a church back in the Midwest. And they said, Brother Stensis. I said, yes, sir. This is so-and-so and so-and-so church. And they said, a couple weeks ago, we were having a special meeting and and boy, we was praying for you. And, and you know, we thought you might have a need. So we took up an offering and we sent it to the mission right away. It should be in your account there. Uh, it, do you have a need? <laughs> I said, by the way, yes, I do. And I went to the bank and I was able to get some money. And we got several sacks of posho and some beans and we begin to distribute that. That night, as we went home and, and checked my email, and I got an email from a church out in, in California. It was not Dr. Chapel's church. Just another church. And they said, you know, a couple weeks ago, we were having a meeting and praying for you in our Wednesday night service. And, you know, uh, we just want you to know we love you. And so we, we took up an offering and we sent it to the mission and, and they have it all ready. It should be in your account. And I, they said, just do whatever you want with it. Just wanted to know we loved you. I went back to the bank the next day. Now, now listen to me. When the Bible says, the disciples said, Send them away that they may go buy themselves victuals. They didn't have no money. They didn't have anything. The UN had brought in semis full of corn that they could make posio out of. And they would not give it to them. They had to negotiate over getting it ground. One of the guys in our church had his own grinding mill. That's what he did for a living. He said, I'll grind it for free. Nope. Don't ask me what I think of the UN. And for days and days, they would not give it to anybody. And you've got thousands of people. They were laying in the streets. They were sleeping on the, the, what we call sidewalks back here. And, and in, in every empty building and every nook and cranny they were around. And they wouldn't give it to them. Politician. Jesus said, give you them to eat. He said, we only have five loaves and two fishes. All we had was a half a sack of posho. God said, you give what you have. And when I put my blessings on it, I will multiply it. You know, it talks about that we're going to see greater things than even what Jesus did. Now, here in the passage we read, it says he fed 5,000. 
we'll kick in another 5,000 for the ladies and let's kick in another 5,000 for the kids and you got 15,000 people there. Now listen to me. We watched God feed 1,500 people every day for three months. We never made a plea. Didn't have to. God, weeks before this happened, God knew it was going to happen. And God had churches already sending in. And it continued like that for three months. That's 400,000 meals. Say, so why are you saying it? I want you to understand the God of this book is the God that we serve today. The God that provided for those people out there in that wilderness is the same God that can provide for us today. And for three months, we watched them, watched God feed all, not us. We were just the disciple that he's the one that turned it into, into to bread and, and fish and all that. He gave it to us. All we had to do is go out and distribute it. And we're preaching the gospel to these people and many folks are getting saved. And, and it just, it's amazing to sit back and watch God work. Not only did God provide for us as far as the food and medical, but God can protect us as well. Sometime later, about three months later, Coney and his rebels hit the town. And they started their raid right down there behind our church. Now, we've got people sleeping in that church. Can you imagine the church? We'd just push all the chairs back, and they'd lay on the floor. They were in there like cordwood. We've got people all over that place. And here come Coney and his rebels, and they're coming down the path, the little road, the pig trail in between our church and the village, Kitson Judgy. And they're coming down Kitson Judgy, and they're burning everything. They've burned in every home along that road. And they burnt the houses all along by the church. Not one time do we know that they looked at our church. We had people in there all over the place. If one baby cries, if some old man starts snoring, ladies don't snore, they breathe heavy. But if some old man doesn't have a CPAP and he starts snoring, we would have had a bloodbath like you couldn't imagine because they're all captive in, that, in our church building. They walked right past our church, burned everything on all sides, and never touched our church property. The military come, and they said, this is too dangerous. We're, we're right next to the airport, the airstrip there. And there was obviously Coney would like to take the airstrip. He said, it's too dangerous for these people. We've got to get them out of here. And they came and brought trucks and they loaded all those people up and shipped them out to a, a refugee camp somewhere. Now listen to me. Not one dime came in after that day. God knew weeks before when to start having the money come in and when we would need it. God provided it for three months all the way through that time, every day, every day, every day. And God knew exactly the day to stop it. Why do missionaries have confidence? Because We've seen the hand of God. I couldn't do it. I was helpless. 
None of the other people there could do anything. The embassy didn't even know what was going on. We called the embassy and told them what was happening. They had no idea. God was working on our behalf, on the behalf of those Ugandan people, and they went to safety. But God taught us a lot of lessons. Can you trust God? He knows the beginning and he knows the end. Can you trust God? Well, yeah, I know God can take care of me. Well, then you're probably a tither then, right? Well, no, I can't trust God to, uh, with my finances. If I start tithing, I wouldn't have enough. You don't, you don't know the God I know. Well, you know, I, I believe God can take care of me, but surrendering to, to missions, Lord, here, I, here am I, send me? No way. Why? You don't know the God I know. You know a God in the book, but you don't know a real God. God can take care of you here or on the mission field. God can provide for you no matter what. When I was in Africa, God, God blessed us with, with all kind of things and tools and, and, and everything. Why? Because we needed them in Africa. When I went to the military, God never gave me none of that stuff. Because I didn't need it. Is it enough to, do you, do you trust God enough to give the faith promise? These people are over there preaching the gospel. They need your prayers and they need your support. And this church, God bless your heart, your givers. I mean, 120,000 that were given to missions this year. Wonderful. But you know, it hadn't stopped us going out to eat at all. Hadn't. Hadn't really caused us a sacrifice at all, has it? Do you know what we could actually do if God had our heart? We could knock this thing out of the ballpark. We could get missionaries on the field with, just with a missionary going to Congo. He's from South Africa. His wife was a missionary daughter, and, and they got married four times. <laughs> That's a whole story in itself. <laughs> Never divorced. <laughs> right in the heart of where these rebels are at. That's where they're going. Why are they going there? Because they've, they've lived it. They've seen God provide. They've seen God protect. And they're willing to go right into the very heart of danger or whatever because they know they can trust God. Can you trust God? This is the same God of David, of Jacob, of Isaac, Abraham, Paul, why could they keep doing what they did? Why did, could they sacrifice so much? Because they knew this God that could and did on their behalf. We've watched God do some absolutely miraculous things. We could stand here for hours and hours going through instance after instance and how God worked and what he did. I want you to trust God. I want him to be able to bless you in such a way that you have a relationship and you can know God. And when you have God's heart, if God says surrender, you know what? I'll surrender. When I was pastor in the church there in Sedalia and God said, you're going to Africa. I said, yes, sir. Why? He's proven himself to us. 
He's a God that, that can do the miraculous. Miraculous provision, miraculous protection. And even though sometimes, yes, we suffer. That's all a part of it. And usually when we need to get, when God needs to get our attention is when many of these things come. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Don't look at all the circumstances. If I looked at the circumstances, I'd thrown my hands up and walked away and said, there's nothing I can do. Well, there wasn't much I could do. But God says little is much when God is in it. And if you'll take what you have and you give that to God, God can multiply that a million times. And he can accomplish his purpose through you and through me. Don't stop giving to missions. See how much more you can do. See what you can do to, to give to God and be a blessing to those missionaries on the field. You're going to have people coming back from your church from Africa next week or this week or whenever they're coming back. They might stay there. I don't know. And you know what they're going to say? I never knew we had so much. And yet we do so little. Father in heaven, Lord, tonight as we think of the feeding of the 1500, the story itself is not in the Bible, but the principle is, and God, you you are still doing miraculous things right in our midst. Lord, help us to be able to acknowledge that. Help us to yield our hearts and our lives to you and trust you, really trust you. Not just with our lips, but Father, with our actions. You said you had compassion on them. And you did something about it. Not just empathy, not just sympathy. That's just an emotion. But compassion makes a difference, the Bible says. Compassion puts into action what is needed. Lord, we didn't have anything but what we had. We just gave it. And you begin to bless Beyond anything we could imagine. You are so wonderful. You're such a great God. And I pray that you would help us to trust you. Trust you with our families. Trust you with our finances. Our, our work status. Everything. Every point that we might have a heart for God. And Lord that you would. Show yourself abundant through us. God, have your way in each heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? You say, well, how does this affect me? God's still needing missionaries. God's needing people to go and preach the gospel to every creature. God says, I want you to trust me. Some of you may not even be saved. I don't know who's saved and who's lost. That's none of my business. You know, and God knows. And if you die without Jesus Christ, you'll bust hell wide open. And that's not what he wants. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to know it. But if you say no to God, you're on your own. Won't you come tonight? Let us take the Bible. And show you how you can be saved. And know that you have eternal life. If, if God is speaking to your heart, it might be about your finances. It might be about your home. It might, no matter what it is, maybe surrendering. Would you come and just come to this altar and say, Oh God, here's my heart. Here's my life. 
or Lord, I need to be saved. Would you save my soul from the devil's hell? Whatever it is, as the pianist begins to play, would you just step out of your place and come? Would you come? Let God do something in your heart. Not everybody else's heart, not just a kid's heart, your heart. Does he have your heart? Maybe God's calling you. Maybe you don't know where he's calling you, that's all right, but just say, Lord, here am I. I'm willing to do whatever you want. Would you come? All to thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. Do we mean that?